he was very weak because now he's young we have trained him all the, the entire day you don't know what is happening so it was very painful but let me tell you the minute i held sean in my arms like this that was it that was it completely 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 my name is marianita wanjiro miss maria a preschool teacher by profession a single mother to an amazing 10 year old son um ceo of stationary finders brought up in the great south riruta um as an only child to a single mother i've grown all my life with my mom's siblings who now acted as somehow like my siblings then um went to school finished and started my career journey yes when my mom left the country left the country I went to stay with uh, family friends who we stayed with for some time. Then um, I guess I was growing, or uh, you know the way people are growing up and life just happens. You probably are not the kind of um, right child for everyone or for every household. So they felt and they always thought that uh, this girl has been brought up by a single mom. Probably she has an influence to their children who are my age mates then. So I was taken back to my grandmother to stay with my grandmother. Interestingly enough, um, I met him through these family friends that I was, I used to stay with when my mom left the country. We met when we were very young. We were, I think, 10 or 12. Those kids, kiddie friendships that you always have. And that's how I met them. And we grew up knowing each other. I was in my 20. I was actually 20. Yes, I was 20. When I moved back to my grandmother's place is when I got pregnant. But I was very scared because I thought, okay, I'm already a burden to my grandmother. The fact that I wasn't left there, I have been brought by other families to stay there. So I felt, okay, wait, from one burden to the other, now to these other burden that I have. And the fact that my mom was not around, it made me feel like I was making a mistake. I didn't want to fail anyone. I wanted to be independent. And when your mom is far or not where you are, physically you're not able to see her, things don't become the same as they were. A mother is someone you can hug when you need. A mother is someone you can cry with when you need to. No matter the relationship, if she's there, things are always good. So for me, I felt like I needed that mother figure and that closure. So it became quite a hindrance for me and I was very, very scared, very, very scared. That's when I decided to start life on my own. Funny enough, I ran away from home. <laughs> oh my god, she was a very nice lady, very helpful. I actually got into a charmer that she had put me in. I'd saved, I think, like 15,000 shillings. And my mom had a fridge that she left at home. So I got the bed and I, she went to church. She used to go to PCA and they would stay the whole day and the entire service till around 6, 7 is when she comes back home. And this is something I always want to ask for forgiveness from. After that, one day we'll meet in Alaska for forgiveness. I went home, packed, and left. And that is when I started my life. I moved in a very interesting place. Now, from Dagwaiti South has five wards. One of the wards from the town side, the first ward is um, Nando Ward, a place called Wanye Road. Wanye Road, um, back then, there were some very nice flats, single rooms. But that was not the kind of setup that I really wanted. That's so many people in one block and it was a very tiny room and here I am I'm pregnant I actually have a bed and a fridge nothing else to start life with very scared I just got employed I'm pregnant and I'm so I'm somehow excited I'm bringing a child into this world but I'm also lost because I'm alone I'm, I've not shared my pregnancy with anyone I actually shared it with a colleague who I thought was good enough but um, instead of sharing and I keep telling people when you become an ear to someone, become an ear that has a solution. You either keep quiet or help out. Don't take the problem beyond where it's supposed to be. Because then that now brings the other problem of trust and everything else. Then again, you're the only person who's been trusted. Then here you are spreading and spreading and spreading. So it becomes a problem. Yes, she actually told my, my boss then, which was very annoying. But uh, I think she took me in more like a mother, not even like a boss. Because we would all make mistakes and there was a way she would correct me. You know that tough love kind of correction? 
Mrs. Karaoke, the director of Play Street Kindergarten. Actually, I keep telling myself if I ever needed another figure and got one, that was the person that I got in that time. Because even when I made a mistake, she'd, she'd of course get annoyed with everyone else, but with me, she'd really, really get annoyed and she'd get so personal and later call me and tell me, you know you're doing this, I want you to be like this. So I started learning, wait, this is not just my boss. This is someone who wants to walk with me a path that nobody else will ever do in my teaching career. It was very sensitive because um, when you're teaching in a kindergarten, these are young children you're dealing with. And I was given a three to four year old class. This is now where the climax of the kindergarten, where kids um, either determine if the school will grow or won't grow. That is where most kids are transferred from kindergarten now to bigger schools. But for me, it was very sensitive, especially when you're pregnant, because you have to be with a child for a whole year as a class teacher. So if you're pregnant, it means you have to leave the kids in between the year. And there was no way you're getting a class if you're pregnant. So here I am, I have gotten a class, I have not said I'm pregnant, I have said it in between the year. That means I'll have to leave my children with someone else. A new teacher has come in, you've just settled, you're learning sounds, you're learning numbers, you're learning all that. It becomes very hard, and especially the bonding process. So for me, that was my biggest fear. I feared losing my job. I really, really feared it. I found out I was pregnant, we discussed it, and um, he had no issues, by the way. I was like, okay, fine, um, let's do this. We're both in school. We're going to bring up this child. So I told him, I think, I haven't told anyone, but you should be the first person to go and say it from your end. So he went and said, and he told the family, and they were, you know those families that I think they've always planned and said, just in case this happens, this is the route that we're taking. That was what happened. They didn't take a long time and they said, now um, you need to choose between education and raising up this child. If you want to raise this child, you're not going to go to school. You're not going to get up for your school fees. I was doing medicine. You can imagine how tough that is. That time my salary was, I think, 12,000 shillings. My house is 5,000 shillings. He was, he was living in Kenyatta and um, he was being paid for an SQ. So all that was going to go, his education was going to go, his accommodation and everything else. Where was he going to come? To stay with me. We were not ready for that completely. So what happened is uh, we decided he will go to school, but we'll still bring up the child, which was very fantastic for me. I was okay. I was ready. And I said, fine, let's walk this journey. So a few days later, he calls me and he tells me we need to meet. And I told him, okay, let's meet. When we met, he came with money in an envelope. I don't know where he got it from. And he told me, I think I want to do what my parents want me to do. He gave me 50,000, which was a lot of money then. And he told me, you need to have an abortion. You're not bringing up this child. Go your way, I'll go my way. And I was, I was like, no, I'm dreaming. I'm, I'm just somewhere. This is just, for me, my life went blank, totally blank. You're alone. You don't know how to go about this. You've brought up people's children. Now you're carrying your own. So here I am, um, new job, new house, new environment, pregnant, and now I'm alone, totally. Today is when I realize how strong I was because I never got to cry, I never got to feel bad, I never got to feel abandoned, I never got to feel like I was alone. I just, I don't know how, by God's mercies, I just woke up and decided, this is it. I'm going through it myself. I didn't tell my boss. I didn't tell my friends. I only told one friend of mine called Grace. And she was, she was very supportive and she told me, whatever you decide, we're going to do it together. 
So I told her I'm going to bring up the child. And she was so annoyed. I remember she kept looking for him. There was even a time she summoned him at her sister's shop. We started asking him, are you serious? These are your parents. What about you? What about your child? And he says, no, don't call me. Don't say this and that and that. And he had this feeling of, I think even that's why I was a bit okay, because he had this feeling of my parents my school, my life, everything of mine is going to. So deep down in my heart, I knew he will come back. I was okay. It was okay. For me, fine. Let's do this. Slowly by slowly, I started realizing I'm not myself. I'd go home. I'm those type of people to date. Who goes home, locks the bedroom. I could be alone in the house, but I go lock the house, the main door, go to the bedroom, lock get into my bed, I close the curtains, I cover myself, I wear a hood and start crying. That is how I healed. I would go home and cry and cry and cry and cry and that was it. The ghetto where I was living was very interesting because most of that block had like new mums and some were actually single mums. So we got to talk a lot and I never talked. I was the person who was always listening. I don't know them so for me I was very quiet. I had a cousin of mine who had just lost his daughter. So he would come. For him to also heal, he'd come and see Sean. So we kind of got this going very easily and very okay. But again, listen, I'm going through it inside. It's killing me slowly. But out here, I'm that kind of a person. I'm the most bubbliest person. But when I go to my house, I could be even sleeping hungry, but you don't know. I know how to pull it out, but I don't know how to pull it in. So it really breaks me very much. In fact, I went to the hospital, I booked, signed in a lot of money, you know. The money was not even an excitement. The fact that I'm doing it, already I'm doing it. So I went, I went to toy market. This was the best part of bringing up Sean. I went and bought all clothes white for him. For the first, I think, zero to three months, I made them, I made sure they were white. But of course, visitors would come and bring in the different colors. And that is now how I started to appreciate it. I would wash his clothes, I would hang them, I'd, I'd get to smell the star soft and the nice, you know, I'd eye on them. That is now when I started appreciating that I'm going to be a mother. But never did I sulk outside or go down in the outside and show that things are bad. My only scare was my boss, but she took it very well. In fact, when I went to tell her, very interesting, I found her and um, she was just there waiting. She was actually on the phone. I knew she was doing nothing, but she was just there. You know, when you're going to tell your mom something has happened and you don't know how to tell her, that is Mrs. Karaoke for you. She was like, like I told her, mm, I want to tell you something. She was like, mm -hmm. I told her, I'm pregnant. She looked at me, she was like, I know. <laughs> so I was like, but now I'm going home, I'm fired. So I asked her, you know, yeah. When did you expect to tell me? Right with her. And when I started to talk to her and to pour my heart out, that boss factor died. She now became a mother to me. She talked, we talked. My class wasn't taken. I was just given someone to step in for those few days that I'll be away. And uh, I had to leave, leave for the holiday, during the April holiday, then come back and give birth in September. But the baby came in April during the holidays. It was the toughest thing ever. You've not planned for it. Two months earlier, here's a baby. You don't even know how to... My maternity was something else in this world. The baby came earlier. First, my water broke, and I didn't know what this was. So I was in hospital by 6 a.m. And if, you know, first of all, I'm looking like a child. I'm very tiny. <laughs> so I'm telling the doctor, my baby has come. And they tell you, we're pangalain pale. I'm mother, just like, okay, you just sit there. We'll deal with you when the doctors come in the morning. So I went for a scan and the doctor was very worried and he told me, your baby is here, I'm going to get a baby today. I said, no, it's not today. I'm seven months pregnant. And they said, no, it has to be today. Look at your baby. So I said, okay. I went, I was admitted. I labored until 4 p.m. That's when my son came. And I remember I always prayed and told God, give me a boy. My reason was <laughs> I 
my reason was I wanted a man who would love me forever. And that could only be a son. So I told God, give me a boy. When John came, it was very weakly because he was underage, underweight. So the strain of pushing him, pushing him back, pushing him. You know, when you're, when you're in labor, there's the pushing process. So I'd push him, not knowing that air is coming in. So he was a very weak baby. So he was very tired. My son did not cry. I was so scared. And the doctor, I remember the nurse, she was a nun, very immaculate hospital, very good hospital. They held my son and said, look, don't you want to see what it is? And I told them, no, I know it's a boy. And they said, no, just look. I said, no, I know it's a boy. But I was very worried. He's not crying. And I know mothers get their kids and they start crying. In fact, when I was being stitched, I remember, I was, I was telling them, no, give me my baby, stitch me. And until now, I, I saw a needle. And I was like, wait, what are you doing? <laughs> because I didn't understand. I was in so much pain. And I needed to know what was happening to my baby. He's not crying, so they had to beat him when he cried. He choked a bit, but he was very weak. Because now he's young, you trained him all that, the entire day. You don't know what is happening. So it was very painful. But let me tell you, the minute I held Sean in my arms like this, that was it. That was it completely, completely, completely. Today I feel sorry for myself then. Yet then, I never felt anything. I was so strong, I was so happy. But here I am, I keep asking myself, what if someone else is going through what I went through? But God has been great and we are here today. He's 10 years old. The best friend I have ever had. When Sean was around, I think three, they appeared. He appeared fast. But I think the reason why I've never let him back in my life is because he never appeared for the father factor. And he's not appearing because there is a son. He was appearing because of me. And he kept telling me, oh, my life would be like this. Had I done this to you, my life would be like this. Had I done this. And to me, I'm like, honestly speaking, I expect you to come back because of your son, not because of me. For me, it was, it was very hard and I keep telling people to date, it will never be because he never came back for what he did. He came back for me. I'm a broken mother. I'm here trying to raise my son. I'm trying so many things and you just come back and start thinking about a relationship. You don't even think about your child. You don't even know what your child does, what your child eats. What has life been without you? That's not a problem for you. Your problem is me. Why are you coming back for me? You should be coming back for your son. Then I would know genuinely this man knew what he wanted in life. I actually met the mom and the mom's sister in town. We talked, we talked, we talked. And I could tell these people are not genuine enough. Because after that, they cut communication. She was supposed to go and see them. That was it. So they expected me to fit into what they want, but they expected me to be okay with everything. I never had an opinion, you know. Then there are stunned Christians. You know those Christians who go to church, who do this, who do that. But this is what they have brought up their children knowing. But there's this other world outside. Of course, which not everyone will grow up as you'd wish them or want them to be. So the, their kids knew this other life, but ended up living in this perfect world in a nutshell. So for me, what I know is what I live by. What my mom taught me, what my grandmother taught me, the, in, the, the Christianity that we were brought up with was not the kind of Christianity that you'd pretend. I was brought up in a PCA church where you live the way you are, but walk with Christianity in a godly manner. That is what I was taught. There was nothing like a tea. Um, you can't hang around with friends because you're born again. You can't listen to this music because you're born again. No. 
there's this world, then there's this Christianity is you and your God. So for them, it was very hard to accept that. The fact that I was brought up by a single mother, she didn't seem she knew like what she wanted. She was doing business, this business, another business. Then here I am, I got pregnant with their son. This wasn't working for them at all, at all. And that's why I decided it will never happen completely. I only considered the fact that he will only have a relationship between him and his son. That's the only thing that I ever wanted. And I remember last year, he lost his dad. And um, everything became toxic between me and their family, of course. Because here I am struggling and all he wants is, oh, I want my son, oh, I want, the mother wants his grandmother, he, um, her grandson. The sister wants this and that and that. Then the sister keeps texting me and telling me, had you done this, maybe my, my brother would be like this and that and that. So I said, it became very toxic. I'd get very annoyed and send them messages and tell them what I thought. So last year, he called me and he told me, I now understand what you're going through. And I know why things have been happening to us. To me, first of all, I was like, what are you saying? And he was like, you don't know what happened? And I said, what? My dad passed on. So I said, okay. And he was like, I'm sure you're happy. I'm sure you're, you see, those are not people who are, are even sure of what they want in life. So I told him, oh, I'm sorry, but um, I think you need to pray as a family. And he said, no, just pray for me. Because right now, my family believes I'm not a good person. I should have been this person. I should have, you know, but I told him, had you made things right for your son, maybe I'd give you an opportunity. Today I've brought up Sean in a way that he knows I am mom and I am dad. So I told him, um, you have a dad and uh, he's not a part of us. But I never want him to judge the father based on what I say. I want him to judge the father based on what he figures it out at some point. So I told him, this is the situation. We are not together, but uh, I am a single mom and we are complete. So I am your mom and your dad. So I actually tell him, Mimi ni baba na mama, Sean, and he laughs about it. And he's okay with it. I don't think he has ever felt or needed to be with his dad. No, I never let that happen. I think once he mentioned and said, so and so's dad has this car, so and so's mom has this car, they are rich because they have a dad. That's when I realized I need to keep the conversations going and going. I needed him to open up more so that we get to know what is really happening. Financially, it is not easy, but um, you have to in you. I look at myself and how it's brought up and I tell God, I want to do better for my son. I'm a jack of all trades and people call me a hawker because I sell stuff everywhere, anything I come across and I know I'll get a shilling out of this, it will buy bread. I get two shillings out of this, it will pay school fees. That is how I've always been. I've really tried very hard. Sometimes it's almost impossible. You have debts, you have bills, and especially when I left teaching and started business. It was, it was not easy, it was really hard. I remember 2018, I started life afresh from scratch. And that is when I realized I do need to pity myself because I almost committed suicide. I thought this is too much, life is too hard, the bills, the struggles, you're trying this business, it's not working, you're trying this, it's not working. Everyone is looking down upon you, you know. Even your family thinks this girl is crazy, she's too ambitious for nothing. I wanted to start a show. And I'd pitch ideas to people. I pitched, I pitched, I pitched everywhere. I started with friends, I started with family, I started with... Before I even took it to stations, I had exhausted everybody that I knew, all my contacts. People would listen and they're like, wow, it's a good show, it's a good show, it's a good show. And that almost killed me completely because I thought, why is everyone so happy about it, but they're not willing to support? Even people that you know have the power to just walk you into someone's door and you start the show, they are not willing. That's when I thought, this is too much for me and uh, I'm not going to stress myself anymore. I almost committed suicide. I remember I told my mom, you're the most unluckiest person 
if you have a situation. That's why I don't blame people who are alcoholic. I don't blame people who commit suicide. I don't blame people who do drugs out of depression. It can be bad. It's another world where you're alone. And I remember one time, things were so tough. And I had an argument with my aunt. Believe you me, she counted what she had done for me. She told me, I did this for you. I did this for you. That time, my mom was not able to do it for me. She was sick. She was in the hospital. So my auntie told me, I, I think I had an opinion about something. And she said, you should never say that. Or you should never, I can't remember what it was. But I can't forget what she said. She said, remember when you had problems, I bailed you out. I did A, B, C, and D. Things I would not even say on camera. And that's when I knew I'm alone. So I tried to talk to my mom. And she's a parent, but of course she's human. She would feel like my child is struggling too much and she's not getting out of it. Why can't she do something that is going to bring her results? I understood them completely because I had not, I think I was surpassing the level of ambition everybody else had done at home. So it was impossible, completely impossible. I remember just recently when I moved out and there was this governor's story about a pregnant girl who had been killed. Because I moved from the Great to Lovington, my uncle told me, don't be like so and so, you're going to get killed. That time we didn't know I was moving with nothing in the house. But of course, a girl who is doing well, who is trying to fight her way out of poverty and everything else on her own, is usually mistaken to be moving out to the sugar daddy or just getting money from weird places. That's when I knew, wait, this is my family. What is really happening? And I told Sean, it's time. Let's go. From that day, things have never been the same. I used to worry about a packet of milk. Now I worry about a client's business delivery. Now I worry about a big loan, you know. Now I worry about um, extracurriculum activities. My problems are now bigger. These are the problems that I always wanted to have. And when people are having a conversation about business, about supplies, this is what I am doing. You'd rather be on the other side of life than on the downside of life. It's, it's never easy. It's never beautiful. You'd rather struggle when you have had breakfast in the morning yeah we are the ones who determine our future it's all in the mindset i keep telling people it's a matter of the mind the day i packed up and said i'm done with my past and left integrity i started seeing things differently i programmed my mind to see bigger and better beyond that is how i knew i was destined for greatness and the minute you put that in your mind, I started working to banks, to people, to giving ideas to investors. I started meeting very many people and different of them. Then I realized my life wasn't going to be better when I'm stuck where I was. Good opportunities are not going to find me in that area. The area that I've been brought up, I will still be there, comfortable and happy. In fact, today, if you go where I was brought up, they still thought this is the star, you know. But in my mind and in my ambitions, I knew I wasn't doing well. I needed to be pushed ahead of it. And I started scratch. Yeah. And things have happened. Everything I ever wanted to do for my life happened within one and a half years today. It's not what you choose for yourself. It is what God chose for you. And if God has decided it, it's possible. Very, very possible. What you choose and you know for a fact 
never works out 100%, but what God chooses for you has to. And I keep saying, I'm not the perfect mother, but I am the best mother Sean could ever have. Thank you.